Welcome back. This is Jay Fidel on ThinkTech, and we're talking about Community Matters today. We're talking about a new model of education for America with Carl Ackerman, who wrote a book about such things, and Peter Hoffenberg, our old friend who, who uh, is into history, mostly European history. But it always has a bearing, doesn't it, Peter? I think so. Yes, I'll say something non-controversial. <laughs> <And Carl, laughs> Carl has been teaching at Punahou right. for the, the, last, uh, the last 200 years. So he brings a lot to the table. <laughs> thank so, you. Uh, the, the topic- 200 the topic, years is about right. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, just counting. The topic I'm thinking about, I mean, the, the way to segue uh, you know, into the subject is, uh, you know, we, we have 70 million people who voted in this election last, last week um, for Trump. And even people who voted uh, uh, for Trump after he had initiated, um, you know, measures that would hurt them. Uh, and quite remarkable. I've had 70 million people. A lot of people voted against their own interests. And, um, you know, everybody's searching around for why. Why would anybody vote against his own interest? Or why would anybody vote for a guy like Trump who's ripping up our democracy? Um, and, the, and the answer, at least in part, has to be American education. The ability to create, create, create um, uh, critical thinking in our students and therefore our citizens. And if our students don't have critical thinking, if they're not able to appreciate these things, how can they be, how can they be particip participating citizens? You know? And if they, if they don't participate properly, if they're not participating citizens, what happens to the democracy? I think the founding fathers assumed that you would have a literate, you know, thoughtful electorate. Um, a query, do we have that? And if not, how much, how much um, you know, is that connected to the, the quality of our education? So Carl, you wrote the book. Um, talk about the book and talk about that question. Um, do we have a properly educated electorate in this country? And if not, why not? Well, let me, the name of the book is a success story in public education. And if people would like to read it, um, it's on Google. And you just plug in that to Google, or you can plug in my name, Carl Ackerman, into the um, Amazon search engine. Uh, to answer your question, Jay, I, I think that you have to begin at the very sort of beginning about who is being educated and where are they. And um, the proof in the pudding is that most of our students are public school students. I think their education um, is pretty good across the country. Sometimes public schools need a little help, and that's what my book is about. But I think... Uh, the main problem is um, information. Where are people getting information? And I think of that um, 70 million, they're probably watching certain television shows, they're, wa they're listening to a certain type of social media. So I think that, that their ideas are framed within that um, context. I also think that there's a lack, and uh, Peter could talk about this a bit more, of understanding and appreciating not only American history, but European history um, um, ad infinitum. Um, because I think if people are in, are in history classes that do justice for kids, um, they're taught to uh, see different points of view. Um, and uh, my hope is one of the cures would be for every uh, class in history to begin with ancient history and talk about the ancient Chinese and talk about the Greeks and the Romans and give kids kind of a perspective that, you know, it's not just they and their, it's not just themselves and their families. There's a larger group. Um, and as uh, the chief rabbi in London who just passed on said, um, Sachs, Sachs, wasn't it? Sachs, Sachs, yes, it's Sachs. It's uh, Lord Jonathan Sachs. Um, you know, people should stop thinking about self and stop th and start thinking about us. Peter, um, what's your reaction to all that? That we should have at least six or seven more shows. Uh, let me uh, <laughs> riff off of uh, Dr. Ackerman's really very important work and, and book uh, and keep this focused on, on, on the book because I think it raises uh, some very important questions and I'll, I'll throw them out and we can talk about them. Um, there has been historically a great divide between public and private education. Now that does not mean that a public school is it so facto better than a private school. But we are talking about public schools in well-funded districts do quite well. So part of this and Carl's discussion is a very important uh, relationship between the two, between public and private. So I think that when you 
suggest uh, the education gap, et cetera. Um, some of that addresses private versus public. And certainly that goes back to whether or not we have uh, schools funded by local taxes or not. So the discussion of high school education and how a high school graduate would vote is replicated by a community college uh, discussion, those community colleges in well endowed areas. So I think the most fundamental thing we have to think about is how are we going to fund education so that the funding is not a political fruit every single election, but it's consistent. Well, maybe you could, maybe you could discuss you know that, at least briefly the, right. the Betsy DeVos phenomenon. Um, and, and why she would favor. So the Betsy, yeah, go ahead. Right, but the Betsy DeVos phenomenon is uh, the Ill illegitimate frightening fruit of the same tree that's been there forever, which is that we do not have a national educational policy. But Dr. Ackerman, you know me well enough, we don't have a national policy about anything, right? I mean, this, this no, seriously, this discussion about education and citizenship can very well lead uh, here in Hawaii, we have the reverse. We have a statewide Board of Education, which is very rare. But if you flip that over, part of the problem in the United States is there's no national educational system. Every 10 years, we have standards, and those standards end up being uh, political battles. So there's a public versus private. And to a certain degree, I don't really care public versus private. I care about the money, right? Where Where is the money coming from? Two is there's really no national policy. So when people start talking about citizenship, well, Tom Cotton in Arkansas does have a view of citizenship. It's not that he doesn't, but his view of citizenship is grounded in an Arkansas educational system all the way down to high school. And somebody discussing citizenship in California also uses the same term, but citizenship there has a very, very different uh, meaning. So I would say public versus private, the lack of national. And then I think, and, and Carl and I could have cups of coffee about this. Um, what, let's be honest, I mean, what is the purpose of education? I think we got to start from the first step. Why do we want in our society, for example, students to continue after high school? Most societies around the world don't, right? Most societies in the, around the world have some kind of elementary school equivalency or high school equivalency. Why do we, and I'm not saying we shouldn't, but I think in order to answer this question, we gotta step back and say, all right, we really would prefer men and women uh, and everybody else after the age of 18 or something, somehow continuing their formal education. Well, you know, there's another if question that follows case, on that. I, we, had a, we had a guest on ThinkTech a few years ago, and she uh, was the leader of a national nonprofit um, that took the position that uh, not everybody should go to college uh, and that a, a fair number of people who went to college were, shouldn't be there and they should be in trade schools if they want to learn a trade because what this country needs is, is the graduates of okay, That's an increasingly popular view and that's an increasingly popular view left, right, and center. And I would prefer, at least for us, <laughs> that a technical school is continuing education, right? That's, I'm not talking about non-technical, but I do think uh, a liberal arts education has a different purpose. And I think one of the beauties of Carl's book and the, and the five centuries he spent at Pueo is saying um, public school students who have the capabilities to continue should not be held back for reasons of not their own making. So the Kahuku kid who could major in French lit, we should do the best we can. And we shouldn't get involved in, well, a Kahuku kid should just learn to fold a, a towel for a hotel. No, the kid, if, if capable yeah. and interested. And, that, and, yeah. and if, you know, if the kid wants to go to a technical school, of course. But I think there's some advantage, even if you had major in civil Maybe. engineering at UH, there's an advantage to reading some Shakespeare. There's an yes, advantage and, knowing about And part of that advantage is what I was talking about at the beginning, is making a good citizen out of him, May, giving him the, uh, the, 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 the wisdom to be able to discern uh, sources of information, good information from bad information, and, and vote properly, because the whole thing is depending on voting. And I think what happened here, you know, demonstrates that we are not very good at it. 
Um, anyway, let me, let me go back to the book itself, Carl. Okay. We, we, we're talking around your book now, but we haven't really gotten into, could we unpack your book a little? Uh, it addresses sure. problems, it comes up with solutions. What are the problems, what are the solutions? Thank you very much. Um, a success story in public ed education. And what, what that shows is the Pollo kids, because this is really a singular example of how um, education can be successful and primarily public education. And what that shows is kids in front of the art academy here in Honolulu. And what those kids are doing is they're on a field trip. So our, the Pollo program, which is described in the, in the book, it basically took public school kids all of whom were on free or reduced lunch, gave them seven years of activities during the summer, major, you know, mostly academic, but field trips, as you can see here, and made them college ready. And it was very successful. And part of the problem, I think, um, with education today, and it's not really a problem, is that people like in our politics have to begin to talk to one, one another. And while I was able in a very small conference to see and talk to both Arnie Duncan and Betsy DeVos, uh, they represent different points of view, but they're both very interested in doing right by children. Um, uh, and I, I think that's the major thing we have to do. And what the book does is it shows by forming partnerships, how by forming partnerships in different community elements, you can really have kids succeed. And what I mean by succeed is we had a, like a 95% um, graduation from high school and from the kids in the Pollo program, all who came in on free or reduced lunch, and they were in the great middle. They weren't in the top 20%, they weren't in the bottom 20%. Those are often the kids that are ignored. And 85% um, of those kids went on to higher education, whether that's junior college or college. Several of the pictures show um, individual students. And if I were to suggest anything that could change about educational reform, the precious uh, graduated um, from a Zion College, um, Evangelical College in Boston, and, and now is a, a vice principal here in Hawaii. So the kids can, if you stick with the kids and you focus on the kids, oftentimes money is spent or people in think tanks or um, even people in donations talk about um, educating the kids. But what you have to do is you have to focus on the kids and get to the kids, number one. And number two, um, and by the way, three of these boys, two of these boys are still in the program. The oldest boy, Mana, is going to community college here, and he wants to be a um, doctor, and he's just lovely. And the, and the, uh, um, the auntie um, is taking these four boys in, and Mana has a, a place to speak in the book. Um, Precious has a place, and there's another person. It, there's another picture of two women. Um, I don't know if you can show that. Yes, this is Christy Wong, who was in our program, and she was in public school and about 10% of the kids in the Puyo program matriculated in a private school. Christy went to Punahou School, the same school as most people know as Barack Obama. And here she is graduating from Princeton and she's standing next to one of her former Kumu or teachers in the program, um, Laura, Professor Laura Kekogila Ackerman, who did a postdoc at Princeton and now is serving at Arizona State. And Jay, um, I, uh, you know, uh, Peter and I can talk about our daughters for the for uh, several days. It, it, it felt <laughs> longer. So, so that's, 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 that's the focus of the book is how one organization, Pueo Partnerships and Unlimited Educational Opportunities, was successful in getting kids into college because we had a laser focus. We had very high expectations of the kids, but also we would work um, like Jeffrey Canada does in his Harlem Children's Zone. We worked 24 seven to do this and we had incredible donors in Hawaii. One of them is on this, on this call and it's Peter Hoffenberg and the, and the Sydney Stern Foundation. And, and it's just really wonderful. And, and you know, I have to mention these people, the Clarence T.C. Ching Foundation, the Harry and Jet Weinberg Foundation, Unbound Philanthropy, one run by these wonderful young couple. Uh, you know, everyone to me is young if they're younger than 55. So Bill Reeves and Debbie Berger and, you know, um, uh, an array of other people who were just so um, instrumental. But our big, you know, we had a huge endowment in our program um, sponsored by the Clarence T.C. Ching Foundation. But I also made sure uh, that we spent as little money as possible in every uh, single child. So the amount of money was spent on every child each year was two years. And if you multiply by the that by the length of the program, which is seven, so we're spending fourteen thousand dollars per child over seven uh, over seven years, and we guarantee that kid 
almost guarantee. Uh, there's uh, 15% that did not go on to higher learning or college, but we, you know, that's a huge percentage in the United States. And it comes down to really focusing on kids and getting enormous amounts of help by DOE principals. And let me just say this publicly, and um, the DOE is doing a great job. No one ever says that, but they are. And the principals have enormous responsibility. The teachers have enormous responsibility. And my solution to all this is formulate programs or our private schools, you know, Punahou was the base. And of course you have to get the permission of whoever's the head of the school. And Jim Scott was a real mensch. Um, and he really supported the program and really helped me in many ways. And, and we had many discussions about the philosophy of the program, but you need to have people in every community. And I, I think it's the responsibility of uh, private schools who have like often 100% rates of kids going to college. I mean, look at Puno, look at Diolani, look at Midpac. You know, these, these schools, look at Kamehameha, they have enormous um, um, endowments and they are able to do marvelous thing with their kids, but aren't they all our kids? I guess that's my key question. And I'm gonna be quiet for a while because there are three of us. No, let me ask you two or three little things. What's okay. The, what's the secret sauce? What motivates the kids to participate? You know, um, you make it as, uh, as enjoyable as possible. And I'm just going to tell you about one class. We had in Pueo for almost, it, when I was head, and now that it's run by a wonderful woman named Dr. Kehau Kalo Huskulian, and she has two people working for her in her office that are absolutely superb. So just because the old guy leaves doesn't mean the program is not still wonderful. Of course, it's wonderful. But the secret sauce is combining academics with um, experiential classes. And what I mean by that is, you know, in the morning during the third year, the kids had math and English, which are fairly traditional subjects, but then in the afternoon they had magic. And there was a man who was a longtime administrator at Puno named Dr. Brad Kerwin. And, you know, you want kids to speak and be sure of themselves and have self-confidence, put them in a magic class. And Brad Kerwin was one of the people I went out when I was recruiting kids, because, you know, by the end we were rec recruiting <clears throat> from 20 from over 20 public schools and we had 85 schools just in the public area alone that were part of the program and we would go out and um, you know and the principals nominated that's a very important part of the secret sauce and we accepted their nominations as long as they were on free or reduced lunch and in the great middle academically and brad would do magic tricks with the kids and he'd enchant everyone um walking into the offices of all these DOE schools by giving people their card, which he would light on fire, right? It's like, <laughs> oh my goodness. And from then on, it was easy street. And we you know the DOE principals, the superintendents, you know, we work with both. We work with several superintendents, but the most recent ones with um, Kathy Matayoshi and, and Superintendent Kishimoto, they're lovely people and you can work easily with them, but you just have to, you know, if you, who likes someone coming up in a conversation and you critique them? For 95% of the conversation. Really? That's how you're going to promote, you know, uh, kids' education? I think you have to be supportive. And of course, you have um, principals like, you know, new one, a principal like James Toyoka, or you have Amy Arakawa, who is out at Kahalu. And then you have people in the community like, you know, that if you're in Kahalu, the name Rapoon is very, very important. And John Rapoon and Paul Rapoon and Charlie Rapoon, Josh Rapoon, all those Rapoon brothers were very helpful, including their sister Martha, in, in supporting Poel. So you build partnerships. And by the way, I, I should, I, I, because he's in uh, the investigative business, and you may know him, um, Jay, uh, uh, Matt Levi was also very he helpful. And he has this wonderful, you know, uh, martial arts program at KPT. And he would always nominate kids. And, you know, Matt is, you know, a gruff looking guy, but, you know, both his parents were political scientists at the University of Hawaii and they escaped, they escaped Nazi Germany. And so most people don't know that about Matt, but he is no. just a lovely guy. So Peter, why, why would a philanthropic organization support a program like this? What is attractive about this program? For precisely everything that Dr. Ackman suggested. It's, it's well thought out. Um, I like that Pueyo is willing to do self-evaluation, right? So to see what works and what did not work. And also in doing so, it's not a one size fits all. I think that's one of the difficulties with education, even though I talked about a national program. Um, I've been an educator for 30 years. Each semester, almost each week is different. So what I like about uh, Dr. Ackerman is it has a strong institutional base. You can 
you have to buy into Puno, right? You got to trust, trust Puno. Uh, I think you need to, as we suggested, believe in a marriage of public and private. So you can't be a cheerleader for private schools and denigrate the public. Or what we know the reverse here, right, is the anti Punahou center. Um, you can't go to a basketball game uh, and play for Punahou and not expect calls against you. It just happens. All right, so we have to transcend that. Um, I think we have to admit something which uh, Dr. Ackerman suggested, but it's hard to swallow in a democracy. You can't serve everybody. So as you suggest, there will be some who, for whatever reason, are not going to participate. And you also have to kind of admit that, but hope that you grow over time. So it is a wonderful program. And though it does not include, it does not include thousands of people, right? I mean, you're talking about taking kids who otherwise would not have a chance and relying upon their experiences as being a model. So uh, people, as, a grant, as a grant maker, I would just add, as a grant maker, um, it has a solid budget. So I, I, and I know that Dr. Ackman has put his Tesla away, so the funders cannot <laughs> see it. Um, but that, you know, when you're funding, and if you're, I mean, you have to look at the taxpayers, right, as funders for public education. So they too want to see a bang for their shekel or their, or their buck. So all of those things, um, I think, uh, make it, I would suggest to Carl, sharing this around the country, but also advising people that it's not a cookie cutter. So you know, take the basic principles and be willing to adjust. For example, not all private schools are really geared towards academia, right? We've seen in this country private schools being a refuge for people who don't like secularism, who don't like integration. So you got to be careful who your partnership is as well, right? Um, and by the flip side, there are public schools who could actually play the role of Puno, you know, Bronx School of Science, other famous public public schools that are really more like Punahou, and it could be a public-public marriage, not necessarily private public. So as a social scientist, I like the fact that the basic principles can be applied universally, and you have to be willing to make some concessions for the local circumstance. And I think Carl is absolutely right that uh, one of the reasons people are angry right now is that one side is constantly critiquing complaining about the other side, but the other side is constantly critiquing and complaining about the other side. Now, sometimes for good reason, but you can't have a compromise or a conversation with that. So I, I, and I would, anybody who's listening, I really would urge them to read the book seriously. So read the book and for what it has achieved and what could be applied in your own, in your own neighbor. I mean, there are a lot of things that Carl said that, that make Kuna like the New York Yankees. I mean, you can, you can afford some mistakes on free agency. A lot of other teams cannot. Um, you know you have an owner who's going to open the wallet, right? So there are certain advantages that Punahou has. But contrary to what other people do with their advantages, uh, Punahou is putting them to good use, right? And it's not, it's what, not whether you inherit it or not. It's what you do with your inheritance that matters. So, Carl, um, what, what, why, why have you done this? I mean, you're a teacher. You didn't have to right. do this. Uh, you do you? Were, Oh, you could have led a, a less complicated life. Jewish by not guilt. Doing it. Jewish guilt. <laughs> well, you know, you, you've really gone out to the limits of altruism here. Why? Jay, Jay it's Jewish well, guilt. What other question could there be? There's no other answer. Jay, there is one more picture that you can put up, and it's, it features JFK. That picture is um, interesting because, you know, I begin the book this way, and I talk about how, um, because you're asking now about my personal rationale, and the um, you know, the David McCullough Sr. Um, said, uh, you know, you can't, there is no such thing as a self-made man or woman. And um, the reason um, he said that is because you're influenced by many people. And um, JFK is standing with, with a man, and that man and his little brother were orphans in St. Louis. Their parents died. And so that man and his little brother were shipped to the, uh, an auntie and uncle in New York City. And the, you know, the, the auntie and uncle were, very, were kind of um, uh, elderly, and so they couldn't take care of them. And so um, uh, what happened was they were sent to a very good a private prep school. <laughs> I always laugh at the name. The name of the school was, well, now it's called the Governor's Academy, thank God. But at that point, it was called Governor Dummer 
and <laughs> not a name you want for a school, but that was the name of the original governor. And I think it's the <laughs> oldest um, school in the United States. I think it was found in the um, pre-revolutionary um, war. But anyway, the governor Dummer and these two boys thrived um, at this school and one went to Harvard, one went to um, MIT. And one of those boys um, is my father, um, Lee Ackerman, who is standing with uh, JFK, who was a pilot, flew in all um, areas of uh, World War II, and um, then uh, went in and became a successful businessman and uh, later a gubernatorial candidate. And I, I wanna say to both of you, when President Kennedy and um, my dad lost in Arizona, they were very gracious. And my father became friends with Barry Goldwater and with Paul Fannin, who, who beat him. Um, but he was never of their political persuasion, but he was still friendly. So my theory is that my dad and John McCain, depending if Arizona remains in the blue, will be doing a jig together up there in heaven. <laughs> um, along with d the dancing Congressman Lewis. But anyway, long story short is, um, and I think, you know, my mother um, was very instrumental um, and uh, co this comes out in the book. Um, you know, she was a Vassar graduate. She took us to anti-war demonstrations in Los Angeles. Um, we went on the Chicano moratorium, which is often overlooked in the civil rights movement in 1969, uh, where, where people were sh shouting out, you know, guerra no, um, uh, patria si, you know, country, yes, you know, no war, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, but um, she was very interested in people looking at all sides of an issue, but she happened to have a liberal bent, liberal to left bent, I should say, in all honesty. And uh, she was a teacher at Broadway Elementary School, which is right down the street from Santa Monica High School, as Peter well knows, and in Venice. And um, those were the major influences. And my brothers and sisters also went into wonderful occupations. And um, Jay, I would not be, I, I, I really should mention this, that my younger sister has started um, an all girls public school at LA High School called the Gala School, Girls Academic Leadership Academy. And last year was our first graduating class. I started in seventh grade. So this is an all girls public school. It's the first one in California for about 150 years. So I think altruism, you know, whether it comes from the Jewish tradition, whether it comes from the parents, whether it comes from the milieu. I mean, Peter and I are both Berkeley graduates. So, you know, I mean, you know, it's, sort of, it's sort of the milieu that you grow up with, but also I think it's extraordinarily important. And, you know, I listen very carefully to what Betsy DeVos says. Um, I, I don't agree with her all the time. Um, I would say most of the time, but I, I respect her opinion. Um, I think she is very interested in um, and education. Um, but I, I must say, I listened probably much more closely to people like Jeffrey Canada, because he is the guy. And, you know, he he basically says there are no um, kids that cannot be educated. You just have to have the right teacher. And I guess that's my philosophy, too. I copied this from Jeffrey Canada. That was very long, but... Sorry. Oh, okay. I, I think we got we got a good picture of you now, Carl. Uh, <laughs> so Peter, Peter, to close, because we're almost out of time. Um, I'm, I'd be interested in your reaction uh, to all of this, to the book, uh, to what Carl is doing, to the contribution that he's making, not only directly, but through all these people that are involved in the program. It's a lot of people and changes perhaps the way they think and do and live their lives. What effect is that having, having on the state? And if we took the book and the Pueyo program and, and we you know, made it ubiquitous, um, what effect would that have on the country? It would have an outstanding effect without any doubt, positive. Uh, but as a final comment, it would face some resistance, as Carl knows. Uh, it's, it's a model which we should think of as a social contract because it involves different types of work, different homes, uh, different sense of public and private. It's a beautiful contract. And I think if, if people are willing to, as I said, read the book, not to duplicate it, but to read the book and follow the principles, bad pun as far as principle, I think it's a no-brainer. I do think, though, that, and we'll talk about this some other time, maybe the three of us, there are some structural problems with education in America that in order for this to be applied, and I would like it to be applied, have to be addressed. You know, for example, uh, teachers, and what are the teachers' responsibilities? Because so often the public schools uh, teachers are not just teaching, right? They're doing childcare, they're disciplining, they're dealing with students who 
should be in a class, but in a special classroom. So all that is to say, embrace what Carl has vision and think about how it can be applied in rather specific areas. But having said that, I'm gonna give you what seems to be self-contradictory, which is not. In order for it to be applied in specific areas, we need a national policy. Yes. We need a national you, think you tank. You said that before, didn't you? Right, but I, I have, and I will still believe it. And it makes me further to the left than Carl, since I actually believe in planning. And we're the only modern society doesn't plan. But you can plan educationally without denying local sovereignty and local democracy and all those things we, we allegedly hold to. And I think Carl gives us a pretty good model. That should be public and private. It shouldn't be one or the other. Yeah. It has to include teachers, principals, families. It's not a confrontation between parents and teachers and not a confrontation between teachers and principals. Absolutely. But all that takes something which I'm not sure the country at this moment can do, which is really to buy in to the collective general interest and to see that buying into the collective and general interest does mean you're not gonna get everything you want, right? You have to get in the mindset where compromise actually gives you more than if you did not compromise. We just haven't, you know, we're, we're struggling with that idea. You know, buying into the general good uh, it admits that, you know, some of what you like, it, it ain't going to happen. But you're going to win out in the long run. And I think that's part of, I, Carl, I don't want to speak for Carl, but I mean, when I read and I know about Pueyo, these are a lot of things that I look into. I mean, parents have to buy into it. And by buying into it, they have to say, all right, this kid who may, you know, may be in a very conservative religious pocket somewhere, he's going to be exposed to other things. They have to buy into that. And you have to buy into Carl and the principal selecting the teacher. So all that is kind of a, a matter of trust, right? And we need, that's something the country, uh, sometimes it's good not to trust, but the possibility of trusting is important. All right, well, is that long-winded long -winded enough? It sets up the next, that should set up the next meeting. Yes, yeah. it's trust. <laughs> general good that's that should be the next discussion the general good and yeah, I, and, and it, how important it is for our citizens and not only be educated and and uh, qualified to vote but also to be concerned about the general good the social compact if you will um carl uh, where can i get this book i'd like to know um if you just um google a success story in public education or you go to Amazon and put in my name, Carl Ackerman. So it's on readily available on Amazon right now. Um, I purposely kept the book uh, cost low. It's paperback and the Kindle version is very inexpensive. So everyone should be able to buy it. And Jay, if I may conclude by saying, you know, everyone in this program really um, contributed. And Peter, when he had spare pens and pencils and found things in classrooms, he would put them in a little box and he would send them to me. And a lot of these kids didn't have these kind of utensils and I would give them to them or you he would come and make a, Shh, my chair is or, he, or, or, or he would make a, a special special delivery. I know it was things that were lost, Peter. I know it wasn't afraid. They were none of them were marked UH, but um, <laughs> but uh, but <laughs> scratch that but out. He, <laughs> but you were you were just so generous, and this was true of the donors um in general. They were just really wonderful. And of course, none of this could have happened without having a president like Jim Scott. And the continuation, of course, is with the wonderful president, who also is a historian, like Peter and myself, um, uh, Michael Latham. So it's just, you know, maybe it has to do with history teaching and, and historians also. Thank you, Carl. Carl Ackerman, Peter Hoffenberg, great Thank discussion. Thank you very much. I hope we can do it again, Good. and I wish you well on the Lots program. I wish the country well on the program. <laughs> Thank you so much. Right, Thank you. Well. Bye. Bye. Bye.